Well, we're going to just kind of uh, shift gears this week. I told you last week I thought we were going to wrap up that series last week, and, um, and I think we did. I think, you know, we, we could have gone on and on and on and on and on and talked about the, the, the thoughts, uh, the things that we've been taught to think and believe, you know, that, that probably need to be re-examined, re-evaluated, and so on and so forth. But, but as I said yesterday, I, I think that what I've done is maybe just um, uh, given you enough of a jump that you can... Uh, you know, go on on your own and do well, re-examining the things that you've heard. And and because uh, we've all heard different things from different places, and uh, some of us haven't heard the same things that others have heard, but we all need to be real keen on uh, re-examining, uh, you know, what we've heard and, and uh, what we've come to believe and, and uh, you know, not throwing out the good stuff, but uh, getting rid of the bad stuff. And and in light of all of the adjustments, um, the thinking adjustments that we've made over the last several years around here, I think it might be appropriate for us to once again uh, kind of revisit uh, the conversational relationship that the Father really desires to have with every individual. And uh, so we're going to begin to, uh, we're going to just kind of introduce this basically today. And, and uh, we've been here before, not to the, maybe not to the degree that we're going to visit at this time, because uh, whatever I've done once, I do twice as long the next time. So, <laughs> because I've learned something since the last time. But, I'm, you know, I, the Father really desires, and has always desired, and I think we've missed this, has always desired to have a conversational relationship with every, every individual. Not every Christian, but every individual. And what I'm referring to right now is, you know, in light of all of the changes that we've found, our, found ourselves being confronted with over the last several years, I'm, I'm talking about learning to hear God, for instance, uh, over uh, the voices of our doctrine. You know, hear God over the voices of the, of the trusted and highly esteemed theologians and scholars. Learning to hear God over the voice of your pastor. Say, learning to hear God certainly over the noise of the circumstances and the tribulations and the traumas of life. Each one of us needs to be able to hear God. And I think that in learning to hear God, we, we discover that we make transitions, that when we need to make transitions, we make those transitions much easier. Uh, without all of the, you know, all of the tumult and, and all of the, you know, the, uh, the difficulty that many people have had, for instance. You know, a lot of people have really struggled making some of these uh, doctrinal changes in their life or, or doctrinal adjustments. And, and they've, they've gone to this theologian and that theologian and, and they've read after this scholar and that scholar and they've, and they've changed pastors and they've said, but my pastor said, but this pastor said, and so on and so forth. As, I, as I've told people, you know, as long as I've been standing in a place of, 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 of pulpiteering, I've told people going clear back to 1978 when we first started, please don't take my word for anything. Because the word you need to be able to take is the Father's word. But so few people have any concept of really how to converse with God, how to hear from God. And so they, can, they, they oftentimes assume that the pastor's word is the voice of the Lord. And I think that's a wrong thing to take. Uh, they, they assume that, uh, that the theologian or that the scholar, their, their particular one. And again, please don't think that I'm in any way, you know, I'm proud of the fact that my son is studying, uh, to, to, you know, the, taking the line of, of study that he's taken in his life, you know. And, and I think that's necessary, you know. I'm, I'm not uh, unhappy with the fact that, that Marilyn and I have been pastors and teachers for nearly 40 years, you know. And, and, I, and I esteem anybody who takes on this kind of a... Of a of a very painful existence many times, you know? And there's many, many people out there who have, uh, have undertaken this. And so I'm not putting anybody down. What I'm trying to do is to lift us above in the sense of lift us above their decision-making being our decision-making. I don't want my decisions to ever be your decisions. I don't want my, where I've uh, settled in my understanding, I don't ever want that to be where you settle in your understanding, you know. Uh, I, I, I want my children to go, to go far beyond me. I want my grandchildren to go far beyond me in every aspect of life, but certainly and most importantly in knowing God and in knowing, you know, how their life can be steered and directed and led by the Spirit of God. And so that's what I'm talking about, you know. And, and I need to say this too, that it's not by chance and please don't take this wrong, but it's not by chance that some folks seem to experience less
I was talking with Marilyn yesterday or two days ago, just thinking about in relationship or in contrast, I should say, to, to many people that I know, how much more peaceful all of the turbulence of our life has been, how we've been able to deal with it in a much more peaceful fashion. You know, I know people that have dealt with a third of what we've dealt with that have quit, turned their back on God, and will never go back, you know, and how still... You know, within us, there's this peace, this assurance, this confidence that he is with us in all things and through all things and will lead us out, you know. So, you know, as I said, it's not by chance. We look around sometimes and we think, well, you know, um, boy, that person got lucky, you know. And it's not by chance, folks. There's a reason. There's a reason that some people, you know, encounter or experience less turbulence in confrontation with these things of life. Uh, There's been a very turbulent Uh, several years uh, among the Christians that populate Facebook. What turbulence, what what, what turbulence, what trauma in the lives of people and and, uh, and Right, yeah. and we in any way. So there's 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 turbulence there. You know, there's there's certainly turbulence in our lives when we encounter these uh, all of the circumstances of life that that everybody experiences. That Jesus said we would have in life, the tribulation and the persecution and those kind of things that would come against us. But anyway, as I said, and and, and it's not simply luck that leads people to make better choices and take better actions in response. Speaking inside of us. Okay. So let's begin with a very common verse. Go over to Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. As I said, we're just going to introduce this today, and we're going to blow this thing up real big over the next several weeks and uh, try to become very specific, and hopefully it'll be very instructional, and help it'll, hopefully it will, will uh, if you're not already experiencing a conversational relationship with your Father, with the Lord Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Hopefully it will lead you into that. If you are already, hopefully it will help you perfect that relationship or make that, make that uh, relationship become more alive in your life. Anyway, so we begin in Romans 8, 14. And I'm using this one because, you know, this has been a, a verse that has been commonly used by people teaching on, you know, hearing the voice of God. And... Uh, For it says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And I like this terminology, first of all, led by the Spirit of God, because that lends itself to something more than, or to avenues more than just simply the the voice of the Spirit of God. Because the word voice becomes confusing to people and and becomes kind of narrow maybe, and they, they have an expectation of something, you know, that really isn't necessarily always there. You know, I've told you that, uh, that I have heard what I felt was almost an audible voice of God basically twice in my life. And uh, one of those times was when the Lord introduced me to my future wife, and the other time was when the Lord spoke to me about Michelle's healing. And, but I have known the voice of God in my life in so many other ways, and, and I am so far from perfected in this. And, uh, and so desire to be more perfect, to be perfected in it, you know. So maybe what I'm doing is going to, maybe I'm going to teach this because I want to get better at it. And if you don't show up here on Sundays, I'm still going to teach it. <laughs> okay. Maybe that's what's going on anyway. But I like this, as I said, this word led because it, it, it uh, lends itself to something than, than just more than just the common perception of the voice of God. But I want you to notice here. And this, again, we'll, we'll have to reflect back on some of the things that we've talked about. But notice it said that those who are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. I read that. I said, these are the sons of God. So in other words, the others are not. Those who are not led by the Spirit of God are not the sons of God. 
And it, it seems as though, uh, at first glance, that maybe there's a contradiction between what Paul is saying here and what we've already learned, you know, from Jesus and from Paul himself about uh, the relationship of, of humanity to their creator, to their father. Isn't that right? We've learned some things about uh, our sonship, haven't we? And so, um, but... <clears throat> If we, if we remember, or if we can take time to just note some of this, you know, the, the progression of what Paul's speaking of here, and I'm, I, and I'm going to say beginning in verse 14, but obviously it begins before that, but it eventually, you know, arrives at verse 19, and of course, again, goes on beyond that too, but in verse 19, it's a passage we've been in continuously over the last several weeks, where it talks about the creation, or the earnest expectation, the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God, and we've understood and seen through that, and, and through other, uh, you know, supplemental scriptures more or less, we've learned that what this is talking about is the revelation or the understanding of the fact that we are all, always the sons of God. That all humanity is always the sons of God. We've learned that. So, so Paul is not contradicting himself in verse 14 or contradicting himself in verse 19 from what he's already said in 14. He said, those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. He's not saying that at all, and we've got to be careful how we interpret that. Otherwise, we're going to develop in our own thought life, you know, well, you know, an exclusion type of thinking. But if we go back here... <clears throat> To verse 15. In verse 15, what Paul does is he exposes the primary deterrent to arriving at that understanding or to experiencing that revelation that you are the Son of God. Notice what he says here. <clears throat> For, let me read verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear... See, he's exposing right now the very deterrent, the primary deterrent to you ever understanding or experiencing the revelation that you are the Son of God, that all of humanity are the sons of God. And he, and he talks about here, he says, receiving, look at this again, verse 15, this is, the, this is the deterrent, receiving again, that word again is important. The spirit of bondage to fear. What's he talking about? Now remember that when we have an, uh, when we when we go back and we visit mythical Adam in in the garden scenario, we find a man who is created in perfection in the very likeness and image of God, and there is no imperfection in him. And this this individual who is perfect experiences what the bondage of fear. Isn't that right? So he's a perfect man. He's not, he's not a fallen man yet. He's a perfect man. And he succumbs, as it says here, to the spirit, uh, to the spirit of bondage to fear. All right? We see that in the garden. We know that. We've been over it a thousand times around here. Well, you know, I heard your voice, <laughs> and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Right? So that's a, a succumbing to the spirit of bondage to fear. And so now we've, we have a... We have a a perfect man who has subjected himself to the or has, has fallen into the spirit of fear. I mean, into the bondage to fear. Of course, first of all, fear of the creator himself. I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid. I was fearful because I was naked and I hid myself. So then he, he has a fear, fear of his creator, a fear of the one whom he has been in communication with, the one whom he has been uh, daily according to the, to the story, communicating with in the garden, in the cool of the day, and so on. And, uh, and now he lives in fear of this God. He's hiding from this God. He has a fear of inadequacy. He has a fear of separation that has come upon him. We know all of this, right? But what Paul's referring to right here is, is that very circumstance, that very situation. He said, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. So in other words, he's referring to this bondage that Adam had fallen prey to, right? And, and so rather than suggesting in verse 14, rather than suggesting exclusion by saying, well, those who are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God, with that exclusionary 
overtone, say, what he's actually saying here, now listen, in verse 14, he's establishing that those who have received the understanding of their sonship will be led by the Spirit of God, not by the Spirit of fear in all the matters of this life. Did you get that? you got to get this. Now, we're going to develop this later on in another portion, but I'm just kind of introducing things today. So you might say this, is a kind of a, you might say it this way. Whenever fear is a motivator of, of your choices or your actions, it isn't God. And what he's saying right here is that if, you know, that, that those who have received... Because, I mean, you've got to put this all together with the, the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits the revealing of the sons of God. And those who have, exper- who have, who have received that revelation, who have es- been established in that understanding, he said, they're going to be led by the Spirit, not by the Spirit of fear. By the Spirit of God, not by the Spirit of fear. So just kind of keep that in mind. So, I mean, it's not, uh, you know... It can be fear of disease, it can be fear of death, it can be fear of, of taking whatever. Any time, any action of our life, any choice that we make is made, motivated by fear, listen to me clearly, clearly even though I'm going to talk about it again later sometime, it ain't a God, right? It's not of God. Of course, Paul says later on in Timothy, we have not received the spirit of fear, but of love and of joy and of a sound mind, right? Okay? But anyway... <clears throat> Now, here's an important truth. Again, we're just laying out some basic things that we'll be talking about over the next several weeks. You know, his leading, the Spirit of God, will always be according to his true character, his true nature. If you haven't learned anything else here over the last several years, I hope you've learned that. His leading will always be according to his true character and nature and or but, depending on how you want to hear this, you know, what you hear or what you perceive will always reflect your persuasion of his true nature, of his character, and of your assumed relationship to him. What you hear, what you perceive, will always reflect your persuasion of who God is. Right? Okay. In other words, anything you hear that conflicts with the Father that Jesus revealed, yeah. drops the call, yep. That's it. right? Or, or makes a bad connection. You know, we have a, an interesting thing that happens at our house, thanks to, to, to all the building that's gone on around there. Uh, and it's uh, T-Mobile's uh, uh, tower is not quite large enough, tall enough over there in, in uh, Timnath, where it stands, I guess. I'm not exactly sure where it is. But with all the building they've done around here, suddenly our T-Mobile folk, excuse me, phones, began to just drop calls. I'll be talking to somebody and they're gone, right? And then, but, but the other thing that happens is that Marilyn calls me from work and she's in the building down there at Loft where she works and, the, and, and it, we, we get a bad connection. It's always still there. It doesn't drop the call, bad connection. So I hear about every third word and about every third word is her, is her raising her voice at me for not understanding the last two words she said, Say. <laughs> So I'm just using these two things. I'm using these two things, see, because I said, <clears throat> anything that you hear, anything that you perceive and believe to be the voice of God that is not, <laughs> that conflicts with the Father that Jesus revealed, drops the call altogether, right? And see, this is what has happened to a lot of people who turned their back on, on the introduction of some changes to their thinking, right? They, and they weren't interested. It just dropped the call. Right? That can't be God. That can't be God. You're telling me God, no, God's not that good. God will, in fact, burn some folks forever. Right? So they just walk away, they drop the call. Or there's a bad connection, and, and then the, argument, you know, the arguments go on forever. But anyway, <laughs> because of that, I'm gonna, we're going to call this series, Can You Hear Me Now? Okay, we're going to call this series, Can You Hear Me Now? And uh, we're going to see if we can't work through some of those issues. And, and, uh, but now, first of all, I'm going to go out on a limb. <laughs> and, and, and I'm going to say that every believer should perceive Father's leading clearly. Yeah. And, of course, I'm not leaving humanity 
in, in, out of the context of believers outside of this, I'm just saying that every believer should hear, you know, perceive the Father's leading clearly. And, and sadly, uh, only a few do. And those few, uh, myself included, uh, only maybe on a very limited basis, you know. And here's what we do. We make heroes out of those who say they've heard from the Lord. And, and of course, it's a very self, what do I want to say? I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the word is, so I won't say that. But we build ourselves up by saying the Lord said, right? And everybody goes, ooh, ooh, right? And, and when, we, when, we, when somebody does hear from the Lord in our midst, you know, or we think they did, we're quick to label them a prophet, this is a prophet. Boy, when is that? <clears throat> but this, this is a prophet. If I get back here, will it be better? You hear that? You have to talk. I have to talk? Can't you? Okay, well, I, then, I won't talk. <laughs> then I won't talk anymore. <clears throat> anyway. But, you know, that, that's what we do. And, and, and then we begin to, we begin to uh, you know, as I said, we begin to decorate them as heroes. Because this is someone, and, and we, go, we, we, we go look for them in the moment of need. We go me, look for them when we're, when we're trying to deal with, you know, the issues of life. Let's go find the prophet of God, right? Okay. Anyway. But I want us to understand that hearing the Lord, well, we got to clear that up. It's really bothering. Okay. Well, it hurts my ears up here. I'm sorry. Okay, well, good. No sense in me suffering alone, right? <laughs> We're all in this together. If we suffer together with him. <laughs> okay. But hearing the Lord should... Yes, Lord? Can you imagine? He might be trying to take over my message. <laughs> okay. Hearing the Lord should be. In just a moment, we're going to actually have a biblical example of what's going on right now. Yeah, in just a minute. So hang on. Right after this commercial. <laughs> no. I want us to understand at the outset of this that hearing the Lord should be the common individual experience of every believer. Should be the common experience of every, hum every human. But we're going to narrow it down to believer just for the... Fun we're having today. <laughs> but didn't Jesus say, my sheep hear my voice? Yes. Did Jesus say, you know, from time to time, my sheep hear my voice? And when they do, I want you to acknowledge them as the anointed one in the assembly. I want you to recognize them as prophets. No, he said, my sheep hear my voice. And we're going to talk in a later lesson about why that remains true, even though you can say, well, I've never heard his voice. But we're going to take it and, and, and deal with that. But, okay, so where to begin? Well, my opinion, did you hear me say my opinion? My opinion is that the best use of scriptures is to initiate a revival of personal dialogue between the father and his sons. I'm not saying that's the only use of scriptures, but I'm saying that is the best use of scriptures in my opinion. That's what began to happen to me 40 years ago when I began to get excited about the scriptures. It began in me to, it, it, it got a hold of something that said, I want to converse with this God. I don't want to just read things that were written about him. I want to talk. And that's what it began to do in my life. And again, like I said, I'm far from finished in this thing, and I realize that, and and I sometimes feel very inadequate when somebody says, can you give me any idea what the Lord would have me do? You know, there are times when I feel, you know, like maybe I have something. There are times when I don't. But what I want you to do is to be able to become confident in the fact that you individually, not for other people's sake, but for your own sake, can hear from God. 
This isn't about developing public display and raising up prophets and, uh, and prophesiers and stuff. And you know what? I don't deny any of that. I'm charismatic in my, at my roots, and I'll remain charismatic at my roots, okay? But, uh, but I will you know, define things maybe in a little bit different way than modern charismata does. But anyway, but I want you to understand that you are to have a common, you know, individual experience, all right? All right, so... <clears throat> So let me say this again. My opinion is that the best use of scriptures is to initiate a revival of, of a personal dialogue between the Father and yourself. Now, let me say this. I don't believe the scriptures constitute that communication. Let that sink in a little bit because that seems to go, that goes against a lot of what we what we've had. And, and I really think that we've become stagnant in our relationship with God because we've bought into the idea that the scriptures are God's communication with men. We'll let that sink in for a minute. There you go. So we've bought into that. Okay. So here's my belief. My belief. Okay. If the written text doesn't initiate a conversant relationship, we've missed the greater blessing. If the written text doesn't initiate, you know, a conversant relationship between you and the Father, you've missed the greater blessing. The greater blessing. There's blessing in Scripture. There's no question about it. There's great blessing in Scripture. But if it doesn't initiate the desire and finally, the experience of a conversant relationship with God, you've missed the greater blessing of Scripture. That's right. See what I'm saying? Yes. Now, and remember, and we don't, we, we, you know, we don't have to think very, very hard. Remember, Adam didn't have a communication problem. He had no Scriptures because communication with God was his reality. Right? And when we go down through the, through the ages, understanding, you know, now things that, 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 that Caleb has told us about, about how the scriptures didn't even begin to be written until five or 600 BC. So we have all that time before that where we have, you know, oral tradition that talks about men saying, I heard from God. Yeah. Noah talked about it, apparently. Abraham talked about it. Isaac, Jacob, Moses. Think of all the people that talked about God, said, God told me, God said, Joshua. And we know, you know, a lot of them said stuff that wasn't of God. And that's what we want to get away from, right? We want to be able to identify miscommunication, but to not shy from communicating with God because of miscommunication. We want to become affluent. Is that right? Is that the right word in, 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 in our vocabulary? No. <laughs> fluent. No, I want to become affluent. I don't care about the rest of you. <laughs> yeah, now I, now I just realized what that word meant. Yeah, we want to become fluent, you know, in our, in our conversation with the Father, okay? So, but anyway, so if, if, if we have all of these things that the, that the scribes began to document, their oral tradition, apparently there was at least some... What an assumption of reality that, that, yes, Noah and God had talked, and Abraham and God had talked, and God had talked with this man and that man and this woman and that woman, and so on and so forth down through the ages. See? Apparently, it was enough of a, of a recent happening that the scribes and people that began to pen the Scripture, the oral traditions, thought, well, we need to tell people that God talks to men. Let's make sure we put it in there. See? So, but, but none of these guys had scriptures prior to that, right? Abraham didn't go out looking for God based on something he read in a, in a Bible or on a scroll somewhere, right? Now, think about this, too. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> if, if all you ever experienced of your mother was notes, there'd never be any intimacy. You get up in the morning, and the first thing you see hanging on the side of your dresser, there is a note that said, make your bed. I love you. And then you go out and then you find them and said on the refrigerator door, milk is in the refrigerator, cereal's in the cabinet, please clean your bowl out, put it away, lunch is in the refrigerator already made, see it, you know, have a nice day, love you, mom. And then you come home at night, and mom said, micro the dinner's in the microwave, you know. Make sure you throw away the, the no, no, not the aluminum tray in the microwave. Never mind. M make sure you clean up your mess. <laughs> 
you know, love mine. I mean, you think about that? I mean, see, that's what we, really what we've done. We have, a, we have what people say, oh, the Bible is a love letter from our father to us. Well, I could have all kinds of notes like that from my mom or from my wife. You know, maybe I, you know, sometimes I feel like I haven't seen Marilyn in several days. You haven't? I, well, I haven't, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, here's the thing. What I'm saying, but I can talk to her on the phone, see? We can still converse. But you understand what I'm saying? If all you had was a, all you had was a note from your parent that said, I love you, that might be a difficult thing to really internalize because all you got is notes. No intimacy, Right? So think about that. I mean, that's one way to, I, I think that's one of the things that first settled in my heart many years ago, right? Let me define communication, though. This will be good, too, because we're going to be talking about this communication thing. Communication means to partake of, that means to take in, doesn't it? To partake of and to participate in, now listen to this next word, another's thoughts, opinions, ideas, and attitudes, to partake of, to take in, and then to participate in another's thoughts, opinions, ideas, and attitudes. So if I were to say, I have communicated to Marilyn what I want done in the kitchen, not only is that the most dangerous thing in the world to say, <laughs> but it's wrong. Because you see, communication means to partake of another's thoughts, opinions, ideas, and attitudes. And when I say I have communicated to Marilyn what I would like to have done in the kitchen, I'm going to be soon partaking of her thoughts, opinions, <laughs> attitudes, and ideas. But you see what I'm saying? I'm misusing the word communication when I say it that way. You know? Okay? So we're talking about communication. Father wants communication. So in other words, one-sided prayer doesn't qualify as communication. You're not communicating with God. I'm not communicating with God when we offer up the normal, you know, religious prayers that we're familiar with, regardless of how well refined they become by our particular denomination. That's right. Regardless of what, what words we use in, 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 to offset other words and to make it sound a little bit more, a little more orthodox, a little more Catholic, a little more Baptist, a little more charismatic, whatever we've done to make our prayers just a little bit better than the group we were with before, or the ones who we think don't know how to communicate with God. If we're just talking to God, there's no communication going on. There's just talking to God going on, right? And I'm not saying that God doesn't listen to our talking to gods, okay? I've been, I've been listening to a couple of little grand boys all, all week this week, right? And I can tell you there's not a whole lot of communication going on at times. <laughs> Much fun as it is, right? But anyway, and neither does our one-sided perspective of the scriptures display communication. In other words, assuming God's thoughts. See, what we really need to know is what God thought when God said what he did. But most of what we have is what this theologian, that scholar, this individual, this pastor Mike, whatever, thought God meant when God said what he did, right? See, that's one-sided. In other words, because it's all coming from our side of the room, so to speak, right? God's over there knowing what he thought, what he meant, what, I mean, what he said, what he did. And I'm over here on this side making assumptions. That's not communication either. And then, okay, so anyway. Now, <clears throat> the word fellowship in the New Testament is, is synonymous with communication, and it literally means participation. So in other words, here's what we're coming to. Father wants a mutual participation, mutual participation in each other's thoughts, opinions, ideas, and attitudes. Now, this is a good thing because this tells us not what, you know, some religious lie has told us, that God's not interested in your opinion, that God's not interested in your perspective. God wants to share. He wants to have communication with us. See, now I'll tell you what, let me, let me flip over here to 1 John 1, 3 real quick. It says, uh, truly, at the last line says, truly our fellowship, that's the word communication, truly our <laughs> fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So it says, you know, truly our are partaking of and participating in, in thoughts, opinions, ideas, and attitudes is with the Father. See, there is a communication that the Father desires to have with you. And it involves hearing how you feel about things. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. 
God wants to know how you feel about things. But God also says, but I want you to partake of and participate in my thoughts, ideas, opinions, and attitudes about things, right? So that's what communication is. So we have to define that from the get-go here. Now, again, we don't need to go here right now. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 tells us that God in these last days has spoken to us by his Son. And that is a huge concept, and we're going to be talking about that in a later lesson. But, but let's just, uh, let, me, let me just whittle one little piece off of Jesus uh, being used of the Father to speak to us about things. You know, Jesus constantly was teaching us spiritual truth by using natural example. Indicating what? A sameness of process. He would say, the kingdom of God is like, and then he would say something that natural man could understand. You know, seed that's cast into the ground and so on and so forth. He'd say the kingdom of God is like, and he'd say something else. All right. So Jesus was constantly using that. So first of all, is that an example maybe of the father speaking to us by the son? It's a small example, but it's truly an example. Jesus is teaching the way he, the way he spoke to us and, and taught us. And what he was doing was teaching spiritual truth using natural example. So with that in hand, all right, I want to use what we're familiar with and, uh, as a model for redeveloping spiritual communication. And I say redeveloping because it's kind of a lost art, right? It's something that in, apparently existed uh, right on up through a lot of the Old Testament fellows, and, and uh, I'm sure it still exists, but it's pretty much a fallen art. So we're going to redevelop it. That's what we want to do is redevelop the spiritual communication. But as I said, in, in doing that, let's use a natural thing that we're familiar with and let's see where, where we can go from there. Now, when we have a healthy newborn, like my, like my new grandson back there, okay, a healthy newborn, all, you know, all things being healthy, has, listen to me carefully, the ability to speak and to hear. Have you ever heard a brand newborn speak? I mean, other than crying, I'm talking about speak. No, of course you haven't. But he has that ability, right? And he also has the ability to hear. And other things as well, too. But, but here's the thing about it. <clears throat> but vocal skills and discerning of sounds and, and, and interpretational skills need to be developed. Isn't that right? Okay. So learning to communicate involves sounds. It involves symbols. It involves definitions. It involves vocabulary. This is all pretty basic, simple stuff we're talking about now. But I need to lay it out here because some of these things we're going to get into you know, are going to require that we've had this as a base. All right, so relearning spiritual communication follows a similar path. Learning, first of all, to interpret things like symbols, which would be like dreams and visions. Those are symbolic. Learning to interpret those things. And believe me, there's mass misinterpretation of stuff that goes on out there in the name of, this is what the Lord said. All right? Okay. Uh, it involves learning to discern sounds. Now, here, this is what I was referring to a while ago. Go over to John chapter 12. And, and we can say this actually took place in our church on Sunday morning when Mike was preaching this message. John chapter 12, verse 28. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said it had thundered. But what was it? It was the voice of God, right? It had thundered. And others said an angel has spoken to him. Hmm. Jesus answered and said, but this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. So as I'm saying, you know, developing our spiritual communication involves learning to discern sounds. I love this one over that we're all familiar with over in 1 Kings 19. First Kings 19, uh, verse 11. And he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind and after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake and after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire and after the fire, a still small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it, the still small voice, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the, in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, 
what are you doing here, Elijah? The story's not important right now, but what I want you to see is, because I think that there was a, 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 there's a point being made here that we need to get a hold of. We see here what? We see wind, but the word, voice of the Lord was not in the wind, right? We see earthquake. We see fire. And see, all of these are pressing, circumstantial voices demanding action, demanding attention. And sadly, this is the stuff most words from the Lord are made of in modern times. Tsunamis. And the voice of the Lord is in the tsunami as he destroys the Indonesian Muslims. And the voice of the Lord is in this, that, or the other thing. This, that, or the other natural disaster because of abortion or homosexuality or whatever, see? But he said three times, it says, but the voice of the Lord was not in these pressing circumstantial traumas. See? But where is the Lord? Well, the Lord is a still, small voice. In other words, an unflustered, peaceful voice. See? Wasn't in any of that stuff. But if you listen and if you think and if you, you know, if you hear the things that are spoken over the television and, and from pulpits and things, and, and in natural disasters, in the loud things of this life, right? Somebody always says that they heard the voice of the Lord in that, didn't they? Isn't it amazing how many times we hear that the voice of the Lord is in things like these destructive things? I mean, going back as far as I can remember, the voice of the Lord has always been in natural disasters. I don't know about your upbringing, but everywhere I went, I always heard, you know, this was God judging the people, right? Well, anyway, but no God in there, right? All right, so what would be an example, just to just kind of, as I said, get this thing going, what would be an example of a still small voice in your experience then? And these are the things that we're going to be talking about, you know. How about impressions? How about a hesitation in your plan, in your, right? Just a hesitation. An uneasiness. Now, not a fear-driven uneasiness, just an uneasiness. And I'm going to give you examples of all these things because, I mean, most of these are things that, that we have experienced and learned from, and as we've learned from them, then we've seen the aftermath of how things could, would have been or could have been, you know, had we gone ahead with our own plan. But we had an uneasiness or we had a hesitation in something we were about to do. These are the still small voice. These are the things that we have not majored in because what we really want to do is find a voice that can stand up in our church and say, Thus saith the Lord and prophesy a whole bunch of crap. That makes us feel like we've been in a spiritual meeting. A spiritual meeting to me is when my wife is sitting at, at, the, at, at a red light down here uh, at LeMay and Mulberry, and the light changes, and she hears the Lord say, wait. And just as, just as she looks up, a, a, a semi runs through full speed, heading up towards Riverside, with the driver going like this because he realized he just ran a red light and he's going to kill somebody. See, that to me is a spiritual experience. That's the kind of thing. That's that hesitation. Don't go. Remind me that I've already given you that one when I get to the time we talk about this. <laughs> But I mean, really and truly, we've got to, we need to learn that these things are, are communication skills being developed, that are being developed in us, right? And as I said, uneasiness, but not out of fear. And, and, and of course, our thoughts, our thought life, that's the big one in, in the uh, New Testament. But what about a peace that surpasses all understanding? And see, these are, the, these are, the, these are the communication skills that are the usual, not the exotic I'm not denying that there are some exotic things. I mean, I've had words from the Lord that I knew I was supposed to give to people. I gave one to Caleb several years ago, and his life today is, the, is, the, is following the path of that word. You know, I've had, those, I've had ones given to me by people who loved me and cared about me, and my life today is a result of that word in many ways. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not, I'm not discounting those things. I'm telling you that, that what's important in this time, in this age, in this day, is for you and I to each one have a confident con con conversational relationship with the Father. For our good, not necessarily for the good of the whole church in assembly times, okay? 
All right, spiritual communication means developing a vocabulary that enables you to express the word of the Lord to others across carnal barriers without disturbing God's meaning. And let me give you an example of that. We have scripture that says, be holy for I am holy. Communicate that across carnal barriers and what comes out on the other end. Ladies, you better get your hair tied up in a bun. You better get your skirts down to your ankles. You better get, right, things like that. That's create, God had, and we've talked about it, God had a meaning. He, when he said, be holy for I am holy, he, he meant something beautiful and wonderful and freeing, not bondage producing. But when you take the, a word from the Lord, and of course that's, that's scripture I'm quoting there, but, but, and you're and you developing a, a vocabulary, developing a, a vocabulary that you can communicate the word of the Lord across these carnal barriers without distorting or disturbing what the Lord was trying to say. That's part of our thing. And most importantly, spiritual communication means developing the humility to admit when you've miscommunicated and the grace to handle the miscommunications of others. And if you haven't encountered any miscommunications of others yet, you were born yesterday. And if you haven't miscommunicated, you were born yesterday. <laughs> okay? Or maybe even early this morning. Because even yesterday might be giving you too much. Okay? But here's the point. The process involved requires listening. Brad Jersick has a thing he does on listening prayer. Very good. Okay. It involves listening, but it also involves study, and it involves practice, and it involves failure, <laughs> and it involves adjustment. This is the process of, of, of re-initiating spiritual communication. You say, well, why a process? Isn't this just between me and God? Because, you know, spiritual communication has fallen into disrepair. And then to our aid, initially speaking, to our aid, you know, come the scriptures. But we, of course, are going to refine what we mean by that based on some of the things we understand about the scriptures, right? So that we make wise choices, you know, realizing, as we've said over and over again, that the scriptures, uh, particularly the Old Testament, but even some in the New, but that the scriptures, you know, contain a lot of innocent miscommunications, you know, that by, from men that were striving to strike up conversation with God before Christ. So there were a lot of men out there that were striving to, you know, really to strike up conversation with God. They knew he was there. They wanted to talk to him. And they began to write some of the things down that they perceived that were going on. Right? And so we have things. We have, we, we have thoughts that have in, that entered Joshua's uh, Caleb's talked a lot about this in his Saturday class, but we, we had thoughts that entered uh, Joshua's heart, his mind. Thoughts of retribution and destruction and, and violence and so on and so forth. And, and he was able to, in his own, and I believe innocent way, say the Lord told me to destroy everybody in, in the land. Well, we know that's not God today, right? But the point is, that, so, so we, we have to be, when I say that the scriptures come to our aid initially to help us begin in this. We're obviously going to have to be wise and, and go back to some of the things we've already learned about it. But, 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 but with that considered, we need to realize that the, that the Scriptures introduce us to, to some of the yeas and nays of communication with God. In other words, you know, revealing avenues that are not of God. Now, the Old Testament says this, you know, that, that uh, when we want to know, hear from God, we're not to seek mediums and wizards. Right. And um, now I'm probably one who would say, no, no, you don't go out. If you're seeking God, you go to God. You don't go to mediums and wizards. But I probably would say, well, <laughs> I wouldn't put it past God if I went to one to speak to me through one. Because God knows I want to hear him. But I think it's probably best to say, OK, let's just uh, let, let's go ahead. And in this case, we'll honor the scriptures. Yeah. OK. Because, really, God wants to be personal with me anyway, all right? But basically what that boils down to is circumstances. And I've preached this for 40 years. Don't look for the voice of God in the circumstances. We already said that a while ago. Don't look for the voice of God in the circumstances. How confused, we, how, how, how confused do we become? We've talked about this before, how people will say, you know, well, you know, 
he must be doing something right because he's losing everything that, that he had. Or the same people might turn around the next week and say, well, he's obviously doing something wrong because he's losing everything that he had. Yeah. Any of you ever experienced that? I know Nancy did when her daughter died, the church that they were serving in. Yeah. You know, well, there must be something wrong with that Mason family. Their daughter was murdered. We've all been around that kind of garbage, haven't we? See what I'm saying? Don't be looking for the voice of God. Don't even try to dig down deep and excavate, you know, or extract in any way the voice of God from a circumstance. Ignore the circumstance. See, we look to circumstance because we haven't learned to hear from God. We haven't learned to follow the voice of the Lord, the leading of the Spirit of God, right? <clears throat> All right, the scriptures help us in defining, you know, this, you know, the infrequent supplemental methods like dreams and visions, things like those are valid according to scripture, but they're infrequent. They're not something that we're to go out looking after all the time, seeking after dreams and visions, trying to interpret every every pizza we ate, trying to get the pastor to tell us, you know, why too many brats gave us this particular message last night, you know. The scripture is valuable in instructing us in the usual, in the usual, which is impressions and thoughts. Now, that's an area that when we crack it open here shortly, you know, it, I think it's going to bring you a lot of relief, a lot of, a lot of awareness. First of all, you know, we've all said this, boy, I knew I shouldn't have done that before I did it. Yep. How'd you know it? Did you hear a voice from on high? Nah, just something, oh, something inside, right? The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, you know? Just something inside. I had an impression I shouldn't have done it. So we've all had that experience. See, Papa doesn't give up because we've given up on hearing from him. He doesn't give up on talking to us. That's right. You know, he wants us to know for our own good and for the good of everybody we're related to, right? So impressions and thoughts. But most importantly... The scriptures, and, and again, I'm going to have to say primarily the gospels in the New Testament, you know, introduce us to the character, the goals, the opinions, and the attitudes of God himself so that we can become familiar with the one we're going to be hearing from, so that we can recognize his voice in the crowd. I'll tell you what, the airways are crowded, folks. The airways are crowded, right? So your revelation of the Trinity is going to determine not only what you hear, but how you hear. Again, you can, you can hear, for instance, I'll use that scripture again, be holy for I am holy, and we all hear the same thing. Huh. That's what you heard, but how did you hear it? Yeah. See what I'm saying? Okay. Now, let me give you just a quick little rundown here of some things that we're going to enlarge upon, then we'll quit for today. So anyway, here's what we already know. We don't need to turn there. We already know for sure God is a spirit, right? John 4, 24, God is spirit. They who worship him must worship him spirit and truth. But then at the same time, we know, according to Paul, we'll just use one scripture from Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, he says, the spirit that now worketh in the sons of disobedience or the sons of unbelief. So we have two spirits in opposition to one another, apparently, because we have God as a spirit who we must worship in truth. And we have a spirit over here that is said is now working in the sons of unbelief. All right. So, now when we look at 1 John 4, 1, let's go look at 1 John 4, 1 real quick. Again, I know this is a little rocky, a little rough today. I'm just, like I said, I'm throwing some things out to kind of introduce where we're going, okay? 1 John 4, 1, beloved, do not believe every spirit. Well, we've only heard about two of them right there. Spirit of God and the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. But okay. But beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world, right? And then if we go over to first John, I mean to First Thessalonians 5:21, well, I can just tell you what that one is. It says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. So John tells us. In the light of the fact that there are apparently many spirits out there, he tells us to test the spirits. But now you cannot, you know, conduct an effective test without an answer key. Test the spirits. How do I do that, right? Okay. 
So our ability you know, to partake of and to participate in the thoughts, the opinions, the wisdom, and the ideas of God is going to be relative, first of all, certainly to our revelation of God and of our accurate, accurate, accurate acquaintance with the pertinent scriptures. And so we're going to go from there next week, and we'll get a little bit better start into the, a little bit better leap into this. But uh, are you interested in this at all? Yes. I mean, because I, you know, I think this is really something that, that uh, like I said, it's, I, I felt like I heard the Lord said the other day that he really wanted to be able to have more opportunity to speak to his children. And, um, and I, don't, I don't think he was talking about through me. I think he was talking about speaking to you and having you hear his voice, know his voice, and be able to experience the joy in his voice.